Um, again, I'd like to just thank you all for coming. Um, I'm here to talk about the role of intimidation in death by suicide in Northern Ireland. What I want to do before um, I start is just acknowledge that these are two very difficult topics. Um, I've been a suicide researcher for some time and I, I find this um, interaction particularly difficult to, to think about. Um, I have attempted to limit the explicit content, so there's nothing um, overly uh, worrying just the ideas themselves. If anybody wants to come and talk to me afterwards, if you've been affected by anything that I say, please do. So in terms of overview, um, I'll just talk briefly about the, the topic of intimidation itself. Um, I'll discuss the potential link between intimidation and suicide. I'll then talk about the Understanding Suicide Project, which is the one that I was involved in. Um, we'll talk about some very brief findings from that in relation to the link and then I'll give you some summary and what I'm calling very reluctant recommendations and I'll explain why when we get to them. So you probably all know them as punishment beatings, you've read about them in the newspaper. Sorry I'm not, excuse me, going ahead without clicking. Um, in the literature they're actually called paramilitary punishment attacks. Um, they're widely um, accepted to be uh, beatings or shootings. They tend to be carried out on young working class men by uh, members of their own community. It's claimed that they exercise political and social control over these individuals and over communities. Um, what I'm going to be using um, interchangeably today, I'm going to be talking when I talk about uh, punishment beatings or punishment attacks, I'm talking about actual physical, but I'm also going to be touching upon intimidation, which Darby says is, is a broader concept and it uh, includes things like exile or author orders, curfews, and other aggressive threats. So when I was thinking about it, it came um, across to me that it's a bit of an insidious violence. And what I mean by that, it's, it's a wee bit sneaky or a wee bit hidden. It's not quite um, as openly discussed as the troubles maybe were. Um, you get this sense um, in the literature that there's, it's, it's viewed as an appropriate response to offending by some individuals. Knox called them the deserving victims of political violence. And this is a quote from an online forum, um, which sums it up to me, and it's about the sense that um, it's, about, it's not just those who assist the British, it's mainly drug dealers that receive beating, shooting, or punishment. It's joyriders or people that steal from their own community. So whilst it's insidious, it has been around for a very long time. And if you look um, in the press as far back as 1999, it started to be uh, recognised as being a particular issue. Um, at this point, the BBC were calling it an endemic in Northern Ireland, and uh, there were a couple of very um, particularly shocking beatings. One, this one is a 13-year-old boy who was a joyrider who was beaten. Um, and you get the same condemnations uh, from, from leaders. By 2012, 2014, which is when we were doing the data collection and analysis on the Understanding Suicide Project, um, the Belfast Telegraph, um, just around the corner from my office, I used to walk in every day, and it seemed to be there quite a lot. And they were talking about there being two um, every week. The police statistics show that there was an increase, but it's now um, steadied down so that uh, the police suggest that there's about 72 um, incidents per year, but again, this is widely accepted to be just the, the tip of the iceberg. These are the only ones that are reported to the police, and there are some particular issues with uh, the police and um, reporting. This is an interview that uh, I heard on um, the BBC4's uh, Women's Hour, which um, it's about around the time um, you might remember that people were getting uh, appointments to go and have their punishment beating, and this is a mother who's speaking. And the interviewer asks her, do you regret allowing him to go? And his mother says, in Northern Ireland, this is acceptable, it happens, and we have to do it. So there's this kind of um, acceptance um, and uh, the, the idea that you'd go to the police about such a thing, it, it seems to be an anathema. This idea of the imperfect peace has been around um, pretty much since the Good Friday Agreements uh, came. It was, it was suggested that um, we had to accept certain levels of violence um, to allow the peace process to go on. Um, if we're talking about intimidation, the OFM-DFM um, report suggested there were 774 cases 
Um, and in 2013, the Human Rights Commission expressed concern about what they called worrying levels of paramilitary-style attacks. So it's, it's still very much there, even though we're quite a long time now from the Good Friday Agreement. And yet, at the same time in Northern Ireland, um, there has been a rise in suicide, and um, our project was one of the ones that was funded uh, in response to that. Um, in the literature, you do get um, mention of the Troubles, but it tends to be historical violence. So you get um, much of the focus being on historical um, intergenerational trauma and very uh, little mention of actual um, responses or, or uh, psychological trauma in response to um, ongoing violence. So it kind of led us to start thinking about it um, when we were doing our project. And Mike Tomlinson, in his report, had um, he'd cited three different um, instances where he thought um, people were referencing a link between suicide and intimidation. And so we had the Secretary of State, State in, or, um, in 1996, Mo Molam, who says that there's 167 punishment beatings, and she cites two individual cases that she of suicide that were linked to intimidation. Uh, again, in 2004, we get a Conservative MP pretty much saying the same thing, that since the Good Friday Agreement, there has been an increase in punishment, beatings, racketeering, and pressure towards suicide among young people. And then you get uh, Tomlinson, again, uh, talks about this. Um, it's, oh, it's a tabloid conclusion, really. Um, the Sunday Life um, talks about the growth of suicide among young men in North Belfast, saying it can be directly attributed to punishment, beatings. But we all have a healthy disrespect, I suppose, for um, journalists. Um, when I actually looked a bit further, I did find there is further anecdotal evidence, and this is from the Korean Chronology. It talks about a young man, aged 21, from West Belfast, who hung himself, um, and that he had been uh, alleged, allegedly involved in joyriding and had had both his legs broken, and that's from 1997. Another mention that I found is from a, a book called New Visions of Crime Victims, um, it talks about the fact that um, the son was viciously beaten. There was continual intimidation by so-called heroes or vigilantes. And this is, his, his son goes on to take his own life, and he talks in the book about how he thinks the two events are linked. But in terms of actual um, empirical evidence, again, this is from Tomlinson. He suggests that in the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee in 2001, there is no mention of a link between suicide and intimidation. To date, I have been unable to find any empirical uh, research that connects the two in the published literature. Um, if you are aware of anything, please do let me know. Um, there is also a lack of uh, research on the psychological impact of paramilitary beatings. Um, that's from Price from 1998. I did find um, a, quite a detailed qualitative study from Hamill in 2011, and it was part of a broader um, research project that she was doing, but she cites that um, over one third of young people had experienced long periods of depression and had suicidal thoughts. 22% admitted having attempted suicide and many of the young people displayed symptoms of PTSD. And this um, was a quote from a young man. He says, my life's scary. I can't sleep at night because I think I'm going to get done. And this is where we lead to um, the Understanding Suicide Project, which I was involved with. Uh, we looked at a two year cohort of, of deaths by suicide it was 403 files in the coroners. We looked at 360 of the GP records of those 403 individuals, and we undertook 78 qualitative interviews. The important thing is we were not looking for intimidation. We were looking for life events that led to or co contributed to suicide, and, the, and it popped up, so we noted it down. And what we find when, when I've gone back and analysed them is that 19 men and no women intimidated, uh, were intimidated in the last 12 months of their life, and that's important because we've limited it to literally the 12 months before they died. We've excluded anything that was more historical than that. So when we look at how that breaks down over the age range, um, overall it's 6% of the total uh, male cohort. Um, it's very small numbers, so again, a lot of caution here, um, but uh, the highest was in the young people, but it, uh, again, it was only five. So we get seven, almost 8% in the 15 to 24 age range. Um, we got 7% uh, in the 25 to 44 age range, and nobody over age 65. So 
In order that you kind of know what we were um, facing, I've given some broad overview of the evidence here. Um, for some of these men, it was part of a long-term um, intimidation, where they had been intimidated repeatedly over a number of years. So at least seven of them had experienced an actual um, um, beating or shooting. Four of them had previously been exiled. Um, in all, again, on all 19 of the cases, the intimidation had recently been renewed, and what we mean by that is the last 12 months. In most cases, it was the last six months. And this is a typical entry in the coroner's records. Um, we have that the man was assaulted with iron bars by two men one month prior to his death, then received a threatening visit from another shortly before his death. He mentioned fear of further assault to a friend. This is all recorded in the coroner's files. So it was quite, um, although it might be a kind of insidious violence, it was kind of quite easy to find. To give you a sense of um, the cases that we were talking about, we've got three examples here. Um, this first one I've called Defence Against Terror um, because the man appeared to, be, to take his own life in, in, in defence against the fear he was feeling. So the first indication of any problems came four months before his death when it was noted in his GP records that he'd been admitted with an overdose. A friend has told him that the paramilitaries are after him and it, he would rather die than injure him. That's what was recorded. The threat was issued in response to an incident that took place in a pub where he offended someone. He had been drinking a lot because his girlfriend had left him and the notes indicated that the threats appeared to be real. In the second case, uh, I've called it hopelessly help-seeking. The man attends the GP for anxiety six months before his death. The GP notes state he's been threatened by paramilitaries in suffering from anxiety, so they refer him to the community mental health team. They refuse him diazepam because he's not mentally ill. Two weeks later, he actually gets assaulted. He, he goes back to his GP. He's very agitated. The GP gives in at this point and gives him some diazepam. There are eight further consultations between the first attendants and his eventual suicide, where he complained constantly about stress, anxiety, and problem sleeping. The final consultation took two weeks before his death. He had never attended the GP before for any kind of mental health problem, and he never engaged with the community mental health team after that point. In the third case, the man, I've called it fear or paranoia because this man did engage with the community mental health team. The psychiatrist noted it was difficult to know if the man was paranoid, had a paranoid personality, or if he was, had an, a reasonable response to the threats that he was experiencing. As the time conti continued in the comments, in the, the medical notes, they changed, and in the final appointment prior to the suicide, it was noted there was no psychiatric diagnosis, and the response the man was um, dis displaying was entirely appropriate given the threat he faced. So the, one of the other cautions is we did not have access to police records here, so that's why you'll hear quite a lot about GP and community mental health help seeking. So we don't know about the role of the uh, PSNI. Um, we do know from one family who we spoke to that they did not consider talking to the, the police. They find out about the intimidation after. Um, this is um, a brother of a man who died, um, and he says they didn't know, the police didn't know nothing about it. We found out what was going on. We didn't want to involve the police because it would have brought up a lot of dirt. And my mother didn't need to be going through that. And again, it's this sense of um, the victimhood status is, is quite ambiguous here. So just in terms of the overview, um, we find 19 cases where there was evidence linking the suicide to intimidation in official documentation or reported to us by family members. The overall numbers are small. Um, the intimidation... Um, but the intimidation was related to 6% of the male cohort. And in most cases, the intimidation occurred within a few months of the suicide or was related close to it. In some, in some cases, it did take place on the day of the death itself. So in terms of suicide prevention, it's very important to think of the pathways of support that were open to these men. And um, I can't stress enough that intimidation is a form of, of it's actual or threatened violence. Um, it's designed to, to control people through fear. I, even in thinking about whether or not I wanted to speak about this topic, was, to be honest, a little bit fearful. Um, and it's fear, not anxiety, that's, that's summed up in the assessment, the medical assessment, by um, the professionals these men saw. And although the medical professionals can respond to the physical consequences of the beating um, or the trauma of past violence, they have very little influence over threats that are actually ongoing. 
So as a suicide researcher, I can tell you quite a lot about defeat, hopelessness, and entrapment. They're all theories to, to uh, explain why suicide takes place. Um, but we actually know very little about the psychological consequences of this, these forms of intimidation upon the men. Um, and we know even less about the impact of being a part of a community where this type of violence is allowed to occur. However, I would say, again, really proceed with caution. This is a secondary data analysis. We've looked at it because it came out. It, we did not specifically go in looking for it. It's likely that there were more cases than uh, we found because we weren't specifically asking family members and we didn't have access to police records. Um, and I am no expert at this. I am a suicide researcher. I am not a, an expert. And I would imagine that um, somebody who understands the dynamics of the communities and this type of violence would add greatly to this kind of analysis. So my reluctant recommendations in light of that are that we need to understand the role of the PSNI. Again, we had no access to records. And we need to know how we can encourage um, the reporting of these crimes because in the absence of a, a, a pathway, normally if you were a, a victim of a crime or you thought you were going to be a victim of a crime, in an ordinary society you'd go to the police. But this did not appear to be the case here. But it may have been and we need to understand the dynamics of that. I'm particularly worried about the burden of care that falls on um, primary care and community mental health services because this is not a mental health problem. Um, there's no pill that's necessarily going to make it better. It might take the edge off. But if you're under threat, you're under threat, and taking some diazepam is not going to fix that particular issue. And I really would urge that this idea that these forms of violence, this imperfect piece that we have, um, really needs to be rejected and we need to say this cannot happen anymore, this needs to stop because I think that the consequences um, of it speak for themselves even if the numbers are small, it's still there. It's me, thank you very much.